<clears throat> well, if you've known me for five minutes, you probably know what my favorite book is. My favorite movie is that, and that's the Lord of the Rings trilogy. <laughs> and there's this one scene at the end that, um, honestly, like, you know, I always got it. I never really quite understood it, um, honestly, until it became a veteran. And that's the scene at the end um, when Frodo is, is coming back. And he's, he's, he's saved the world. He's destroyed the rave, right? Um, and he has this twist at the end. You think all is going to be happily ever after. There's this twist when Frodo suddenly announces he can't stay home. He's got to leave instead to live out his days in a place where his wounds will heal. And I think that Tolkien, as a veteran of World War I, some terrific battles there, <laughs> snuck this in. But he says this, this is the scene uh, in the book here, his actual picture of Tolkien, by the way. But, said Sam, and tears started in his eyes, I thought you were going to enjoy the Shire too for years and years after all that you've done. So I thought too once, said Frodo, but I have been too deeply hurt, Sam. I tried to save the Shire, and it has been saved but not for me. It must often be so, Sam, when things are in danger. Someone has to give them up, lose them, so that others may keep them. It's a reality for everyone who's been, as our national anthem puts it, one of those free men who stands between their loved homes and war's desolation. That hidden cost of war for those who come back but don't come back whole. And for some, that struggle claims their life. According to a Veterans Affairs report, when the war on terrorism began, the suicide rate for veterans was only 12% higher than non-veterans. By 2017, the suicide rate for veterans was 66.2% higher. The second leading cause of death for veterans below the age of 45. A silent tragedy of war. In our passage today, David will deal with the tragedy of war and the scar that it leaves on his life and future dreams. For us, whether you're a veteran or not, it highlights a tragedy that we all face, sometimes, many times in our life, the tragedy of God saying no to our hopes and dreams. It's absolutely jarring. It can shake our faith. It can make every choice look pointless and the future look hopeless. How do we respond in these moments of heart crisis? How do we give God our tomorrow when it feels like God has robbed us of it? Well, I have an answer. I believe the Word of God has an answer for us. But it's, we're going to need to take a journey to get there. So we're going to take one. It won't take three hours like Frodo's journey, okay? But we'll have to take a journey. But first, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for its honesty. And we thank you for the comfort it provides. Father, we, we thank you, first of all, just for that sacrifice of your son. For Jesus, who gave up his life that others may find theirs. Just as Oaken's story reminds us of. It's not just a story. It's not just better. And it's a reality that we, we all celebrated the last week. But I pray that we celebrate it in our hearts. And that... That future through Christ gives us hope when we place our faith and trust in Him. Help us today to place our faith and trust more fully in You as we behold Your Word. Make it lift to us, we pray. In Jesus' name, Amen. So, our first passage in our journey comes from 1 Chronicles 22, and it goes like this Then David called for Solomon, his son, and charged him to build a house for the Lord, the God of Israel. David said to Solomon, My son, I had it in my heart to build a house to the name of the Lord my God. But the word of the Lord came to me, saying, You have shed much blood and have waged great wars. You shall not build a house to my name, because you have shed so much blood before me on the earth. Behold, a son shall be born to you, who shall be man of rest. I will give him rest from all his surrounding enemies. For his name shall be Solomon, and I will give peace and quiet to Israel in his days. He shall build a house for my name. He shall be my son, and I will be his father, and I will establish his royal throne in Israel forever. You know, looking at this passage, there's just so much I could say, but, but first of all, I want us to really enter into this passage. 
this isn't a book that some author just wrote up. This is not fictional characters. David and Solomon are sitting down in a real moment. They're living out their lives just as we are, moment by moment in the present, in the snapshot that we get. It's not a movie. It was their life. And you can just picture David and Solomon, probably a young man, and maybe put his arm around him and said, Son, son, I've got something that you need to know. As I get older, I can appreciate that the fact that, uh, you know, as you're growing up with children, you kind of guard them a little bit from your thoughts and your adult, or your adult thinking. But as they get older, you get to share more and more of that with them. And I'm enjoying that. And David enters into that moment. He says, my son, I had this dream. I had this longing in my heart, but God said I couldn't have it. You know, one of the things that Cindy and I have been wrestling with feels like more lately. He says, why didn't anybody tell us when we were growing up that our dreams weren't going to come true? <laughs> I felt like, you know, especially being a child of the 80s and 90s, man, but it felt like the economy is booming, the country is on top, you can do anything you set your mind to, you know, just go to college and get a great job and everything will be perfect. Someone sold us a bill of goods, guys. <laughs> you know, doing the right thing doesn't always mean getting the right outcome. Have you noticed that? Well, somebody did actually tell us. Here it is, you know, whatever anybody else did, God's word does in this passage. David dreamed of building God a temple, but God said no. God didn't say this is a bad dream. This is a wrong dream. God actually would have his son build it instead. He didn't say David couldn't help. In fact, David gathered the materials for it. He just couldn't build that temple. He would fight wars to pave the way for the peace that allowed the temple to be built. But here's the kicker. Those same wars are what's actually going to disqualify David in God's eyes from building God's temple. Why? Is warfare wrong? This is when I dug into this passage. This was actually what I was curious about finding out. Why was David disqualified? What was going on in David's life? Is warfare wrong? Did David sin? No. No, actually not at all. The wars he fought were in service to the Lord. They were holy wars. And their victories were blessed and secured by the Lord. The blood David shed was according to the will of the Lord. The same Lord who trained David's hands for war, according to Psalm 144.1. The same Lord who had given David Saul's throne because Saul had refused to completely wipe out the Amalekites. It's actually, too, an obvious hint that David should have fought at least one more war than he did when he was at the palace looking at Bathsheba instead of out in the field in the time when the kings go to battle. So no, David wasn't, he, David was doing what God wanted him to do when he fought and killed. So then I, I dug down as the answer deeper. Was it because David was bloodthirsty that maybe he fought those holy wars but had it in his heart to be an instigator, somebody who picks fights? And while the scripture tells us that he gladly fought lions and bears in defense of his sheep as a boy, he gladly slew Goliath and many others in defense of God's name and God's people, we don't find evidence of him being cruel or bloodthirsty. Actually, evidence perhaps to the contrary. Psalm 126 and 7 tells us that David was at heart a man of peace. He writes, too long have I had my dwelling among those who hate peace. I am for peace, but when I speak, they are for war. David longed for peace in his heart, though he was a man of war. And so we come to the inescapable conclusion that David was disqualified by God to build the temple because he did what God had purposed to provide David to do. David did what God asked for. And that's actually why God said, no, you're disqualified. That's a kicker. Does that seem unfair to anyone else, if we're honest? On paper, that seems unfair. What unfairnesses have you faced that smell so much like this right now? What things have you been barred from doing that your heart wanted? Good things that you were denied because of circumstances beyond your control? and by definition in the control of a sovereign God. I don't know everyone's stories, but when I was contemplating this and just thinking of the stories I do know in this room, 
I know that this is a pain that's present in many of our paths. Good things we wanted, good things that could have glorified God, and yet, yet God said no. It's happened before, it probably will again. That's life under the sun. So how do we respond to it? I promised you an answer, so let's look at how David responds when he first hears this news. Uh, we're going to roll back to 2 Samuel 7. This is going to be our main text, and it'll be on the board for you. But here's what I see. Here's the conclusion I come to when I see this. I see that there are bad things God doesn't want us to have. Right? He doesn't want us to have sin. That's clear. But there are also good things that God doesn't want us to have. And so in the face of it, we must embrace and rejoice in the good things that God does want us to have. But don't take my word for it. Let's take a look at 2 Samuel 7. Right? That's our main idea, and we'll come back to it. But that's my proposition. Let's see if it holds up. 2 Samuel 7, verse 1 says, Now when the king lived in his house, and the Lord had given him rest from all his surrounding enemies, the king said to Nathan the prophet, See now, I dwell in a house of cedar. But the ark of God dwells in a tent. And Nathan said to the king, Go, do all that is in your heart, for the Lord is with you. But that same night, the word of the Lord came to Nathan, Go and tell my servant David, thus says the Lord, Would you build me a house to dwell in? I have not lived in that house since the day I brought up the people of Israel from Egypt to this day. But I have been moving about in a tent for my dwelling. In all places where I have moved with all the people of Israel, did I speak a word with any of the judges of Israel, whom I commanded to shepherd my people of Israel, saying, Why have you not built me a house of cedar? Now therefore, thus you shall say to my servant David, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pasture, from following the sheep, that you should be a prince over my people Israel. And I've been with you wherever you went, and I've cut off all your enemies from before you, and I will make for you a great name, that the name of the great ones of the earth. And I will appoint a place for my people Israel, and will plant them so that they may dwell in their own place, and be disturbed no more. And violent men shall afflict them no more, as formerly, from the time that I appointed judges over my people Israel. And I will give you rest from all your enemies. Moreover, the Lord declares to you that the Lord will make you a house. When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you, who shall come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be to him a father, and you shall, he shall be to me a son. When he commits iniquity, I will discipline him with the rod of men, the stripes of the sons of men, but my steadfast love will not depart from him. As I took it from Saul, whom I put away from before you, and your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. In accordance with all these words, and in accordance with this vision, David's, Nathan spoke to David. So, that was a lengthy passage. Here's what we need to know. First of all, know that what David was asking for was good. What David asked for was good. And there's another passage, um, 2 Kings 8.18. It makes it even more clear. The Lord said to David, my father, whereas it was in your heart to build a house for my name, you did well that it was in your heart. Nathan the prophet affirmed and supported the goodness of his desire. Right? We saw that in verse 3. He said, go and do all that's in your heart. The Lord is with you. David asked for a good thing. And yet God said no. What David was asking for was good. Secondly, what David asked for was God's glory. David was asking for God to be glorified. It felt wrong to him to, to live in a better house than the ark. Now, I, I like to work with wood. I like to build things. But I'm always on a budget, so usually that's pine. But recently I got to make some shutters, and I made them out of cedar. Have you ever been around cut cedar? It smells so good. Can you imagine a house full of cedar? He's walking around, he's got his palace, smells good, it looks good, and he's, wait a minute, God's ark is in a tent, and I'm living in this place. 
I want God to be glorified like I feel like I've been glorified living in this palace. It felt wrong for him to live in a better place than the ark. He wanted God to be glorified. Uh, Westminster Catechism number one says, what's the chief end of man? To glorify God and to enjoy him forever. David was right in the center of that, wasn't he? He asked for something good, and he asked for God's glory. He's doing what man's supposed to do, right? But God still said no. And so we have this principle that I want to draw out here, too, that, that there are good things that we're going to want that God says no to. And so I want to caution you not to necessarily view that no as an indictment that what you wanted wasn't good. Or I don't want you to think that it wouldn't glorify God. Just because God says no doesn't mean it's bad, what you asked for. Doesn't mean it wouldn't glorify God. Right? We actually mentioned this came up in Sunday school, right? That, that hey God, I, if you'll heal this person, you'll be glorified. Yeah, it might be true, right? God still might say no. Maybe a good desire for a good thing that glorifies God in a good way. That no may simply mean, one, that it's good, but it's not for you right now. <coughs> your request may be good. God may fulfill your request, just the timing is off. God reminds us of this in verses 5 through 7. He says, I haven't asked for a temple from any of Israel's leaders before, right? The time wasn't right. He didn't ask Moses. He said, Moses, build me a tabernacle, build me a tent. He didn't say, stop and build this temple. Right? He didn't ask Samson. He didn't ask any of the judges. He didn't ask Saul. God ordered and empowered the building of the temple in the right time, but the time wasn't right before. And it's because God's good depends on God's timing. It may very well be that if God tells you no, it might be a question of timing. The no may be yes later. And secondly, the no may mean it's good, but I want someone else to have that. And verse 13 says Solomon was going to be God's pick for the builder of the temple. God wanted a man of peace to build the temple, and David's wars had brought that, had bought that for his son, but it meant that David would lose that privilege for himself. And so it would be Solomon whom God would deem most qualified. And boy, that is the no that stings the most, isn't it? That's a good idea. Someone else is going to do it. Ouch. For, to have God say maybe later leaves hope, doesn't it? But to hear not you, that's a hope killer. It's rejection. And the thing about rejection is, have you noticed it draws up all the rejection you've ever felt in your life? It parades it before your eyes and makes you feel every wound all over again, doesn't it? Rejection is a killer. What do we do with that rejection? We know, too, because God is in control, that that man's rejection is, in a sense, God's rejection. Whether it's from a school that you wanted to get into, at a job you wanted to have, a ministry opportunity, a romantic relationship, a chance to have children, a hope that they'll turn out a certain way. Any other hope or prayer you have for your life. To hear, this is a good request, but it's not what I'm going to do for you. It sounds so much like, I don't like you, I don't want you, and I'm not going to take care of you. But that's not what God ever says. Not even in a no. Read what God says to David and what he says to you. God says instead, I love you. I've cared for you all your life, and I will keep taking good care of you. you blink and you'll miss this. Because, but, but know that God is intentional in the way that he words everything. That's the richness of the, the Bible. This is not coincidence. This is intentional speech. Look what verse 8 says, and I've got it up on the board here. Thus says Yahweh, right? Whenever you see in your Bible the Lord all in caps. And that's God's covenant personal name revealed to his people. I, mean, I, often, I often try to tell my wife and kids I love them. And sometimes I'll, I'll tell Cindy, your husband loves you. Tell the kids, your daddy loves you. 
I want to call them to mind that covenant connection, right? That love of who I am and what I have for them by choice and by bond. And God does the same thing here with David. Not just thus says me, not just this says God, this says Yahweh of hosts. And notice the title, right? Notice the title he's choosing this moment. The Lord of hosts. Sometimes it's a word that kind of slinks by. What is the Lord of hosts? What do you mean hosts? I don't know. Um, what does host mean? We don't use that word anymore. Uh, a better translation would be to say God of the armies. I am Yahweh, the God of angel armies. So many names he could have picked, right? He could have called himself Jehovah Jireh, the Lord who provides, because he provides David a legacy in this passage. He could call himself El Shaddai, Yahweh Rapha, the Lord that heals, promising to heal the wounds of David's pain. But no, instead, he chose to say to David, Yahweh of the armies. What is he saying here? Put it, put it together. You're disqualified because you're a man of war. By the way, I'm Yahweh of the armies. He says, I like you. Not just I love you, I like you. I like the me I've made in you. And the person I've made you to be is good. He made David a warrior as a reflection of one aspect of the divine nature. Exodus 15, 3 says, the Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name, right? Yahweh is a man of war. Yahweh is his name. David images God in his war fighting. He has not wasted his life just because this thing disqualifies David from what he wants right now. He says, I like you, I made you a certain way. That way is good. Just because you can't have this thing doesn't mean I don't like you. It doesn't mean I made you in the wrong way. It's beautiful. It's right there. He says, I took you from the pasture, from following the sheep that you should be prince over my people, Israel. And I've been with you wherever you went and have cut off all your enemies from before you. And I will make you a great name, like the names of the great ones of the earth. If I could summarize that and make it personal, make it a message that God's giving us here today. God is saying, I love you. I have cared for you all your life. And I will keep taking good care of you. That's what sums up there. I will make you a great name. I will keep taking care of you. You still have good things in the future. It's all right there. And so when you face these no's from the Lord that are not the result of sin or bad request, but are good and good-hearted motivations that are rejected, hold on to this fact. Hold on to the fact that for believers, we can be confident that God loves us. And even, guys, that God likes us. For some, that's the hardest thing to believe, isn't it? Because we've heard so many I don't like yous. We've been hurt. Sometimes we put that on God. It's not what I see here. God doesn't tell David I don't like you. And listen, we know. David was not perfect. He's going to mess. He's giving the temple to a man who is probably way less perfect than David. This is not an indictment on who he is and what he's done and whether God likes him or not. He just says, this is my plan for you. My plan was to make you a war fighter. Your son will be a man of peace. I'm going to give it to him. So make that, make that belief that God loves you and he likes you. Make it help you be confident. Make it the foundation of your response. That you don't question those things and start believing lies. It's so easy to believe lies when you're hurt. That's not what God calls David. I don't think that's what God calls us. Think about it. Do we have less favor than David? Do we have less favor than David? Sometimes we might think of being raised in the Sunday school with the flannel graphs and all that. Well, that's David. Come on. God liked David more than me. Really? It's the same grace and mercy that God extends to David in salvation that's on offer for us. David's qualification for being with the Father right now is the same that will be for us. Jesus. Christ alone. Faith alone. That's it. It's the same ticket. He doesn't get some special VIP backdoor entrance into heaven because he's David. It's the same gates he walks through on the same basis. We look back on the son that he's looking forward to, right? But we are promised the son as well. And that salvation that goes along past bloodlines. 
And yes, David was a king, right? But Jesus tells us in Luke 12, 32, that it's the Father's good pleasure to give us the kingdom. We may not have a crown on our heads like David, but Jesus tells us, and that's the word of God right there, that the Father gives us the kingdom. Not just that he grudgingly says, fine, here you can have it, right? Like I can sometimes be when the kids ask for ice cream, okay. Right? No, it's the Father's good pleasure. He has planned this out. He has worked this out. And he is happy to give us that kingdom. So don't get hung up on status. David was no superman. As my wife so powerfully pointed out to me one day, God only has one kind of love. And it's the same kind of love he has for Jesus. You, me, David, we all stand in that same love and favor. So if you stand in the same experience as David, who heard God say no to his hope and dream, then let me comfort you further with the reminder that this no still means God has other good things for you to do, just as he did for David. Puritan commentator Matthew Henry says, David is a man of war, and he must enlarge the borders of Israel by carrying on their conquests. We see that in the next chapter, by the way. He goes on to continue war. David is a sweet psalmist, and he must prepare songs for the use of the temple when it's built, and settle the courses of the Levites, but his son's genius will better suit the building of the house, and he will have a better treasure to bear the charge of, and therefore let it be reserved for him to do. As every man hath received the gift, so let him minister. And Matthew Henry finishes out by saying, whatever we do for God, or sincerely design to do through providence, though providence prevents us from doing it, we shall in no wise lose our reward. God has other things for us to do. We don't lose our reward to hear and know. And so that's the first part of my big idea in this message, right? That in the face of the no to the good things God doesn't want us to have, we must embrace the good things that he does want us to have. And the second half of that is that we must rejoice in those things. Not just embrace, not grudgingly accept, but rejoice. So let's note how David rejoices as we continue on this passage. Verses 18 through 29 of 2 Samuel 7. Then King David went in and sat before the Lord and said, Who am I, O Lord God, and what is my house that you have brought me this far? And yet this was a small thing in your eyes, O Lord God. You have spoken also of your servant's house for a great while to come. And this is instruction for mankind, O Lord God. And what more can David say to you? For you know your servant, O Lord God, because of your promise and according to your own heart, you have brought about all this greatness to make your servant know it. Therefore, you are great, O Lord God. There is none like you. There is no God beside you, according to all that we've heard with our ears. David rejoices. David embraces and David rejoices. God do the same. There's three things I notice about his response. First of all, that his answer is in humility. It's in humility. It's the right standing before the Lord. It's the only stance we should take. Humility. He starts off by saying, who am I? Well, he stands there. You know that he was probably faced with the same temptation that we are, right? And that's pride. I asked for this and you didn't give it. Really, God? Really? I earned that. I worked so hard for that. Listen, pride gets in the way of worship and rejoicing every time. Pride gets in the way of worship and rejoicing. While the heart's temptation is to list all the reasons you deserve the thing denied, why you earned it, creation's honest look at creator must be open-handed. Nothing in my hands I bring simply to the cross I claim. As C.S. Lewis wrote, I know now, Lord, why you utter no answer. You yourself are the answer. Before your face, questions die away. What other answer would suffice? Only words, words, to be led out in battle against other words. We stand before a creator. We must be meek and probably mute. He himself is the answer for the questions. When we go to heaven, we're probably going to be finding that we have less questions than we think. We'll see him and be like, okay, yeah, you did have this. 
And God has given us living, his living word as proof of both our utter need of him and his utter provision to us. His plan is right and best, and the humble heart is blessed to recognize it. As he says in Matthew eleven six, 6, blessed is he who's not offended because of me. So his answer is in humility. David's answer is also in gratitude, secondly. David is grateful for what the Lord does have for him. I wonder, would he have traded the temple, building the temple in his lifetime for the dynasty he we would, he would live to see? If that was a trade he could make. But he say, Lord, you don't have to make my throne forever. Just let me see the temple in my lifetime. I, just let me see the thing I can see. Don't let me die having to believe in faith. That's hard, God. Are we too quick to yearn for and seek to trade the results and rewards in the here and now? Do we seek the quick harvest rather than the richer rewards that may pay off beyond our days? <clears throat> Do we, like Esau, trade stew for our birthrights, seeking full bellies rather than strong legacies? I think too often we do. I think we stand in a generation that's thinking about what can I get for me instead of what's best for my bloodline, what's best for my children and their children, what country can I leave them, what stories can I leave them with, what wisdom can I impart to them, even if I don't live to see it, even if I don't live to see them taking my advice. And I still hope in that. It's harder. It's harder. I'm not saying it's not. David's answer is in gratitude. David's answer magnifies the greatness of God. This is why we can do those things. This is why we can stand in humility. This is why we can be grateful. It's because of the greatness of God. His answer is a reminder of the purpose of our lives and of everything good brought into it, right? To glorify God and enjoy Him forever. And we do neither of those things when we pout, when we get depressed, or when we receive his gifts with an ungrateful spirit. We don't magnify the greatness of God when we complain, do we? And I was thinking in Sunday school today, we were talking about, you know, I looked at Linda, I was like, why are we bad? You know, I was thinking about that, rallying my head. Why do we do these things? Why do we complain? Why do I complain so much? And I think that I complain because I want somebody to fix it. I want either to be comforted, just to feel like they get me, or two, I just want someone to fix it. I wonder, at here at 42, am I ever going to get over the desire for my daddy to fix things? I suspect not. But that's because we have a desire for our daddy to fix things. So instead of complaining, why not take it to God and do something about it? Or to somebody who walked those paths with us, right? We need to take the advice of that hymn writer, right? Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full of his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Taking to the writer of Hebrews, consider him, consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. In the face of the no, the good things God doesn't want us to have, we must embrace the good things he does want us to have. And this was a kicker for me, guys. Close the kids off. Jesus knows what it felt like. Jesus prayed in the garden for the cup of God's wrath to pass from for there to be any other way of saving humanity than enduring the cross. And the Father said, no. Does he love Jesus less? Does he like Jesus less? It wasn't God's plan. It wasn't for him. That was the reason Christ was sent. Christ took that no. And scripture tells us he pressed on for the joy set before him. Embrace and rejoice. He did it for us to show us. This is how you do it, guys. Not only this is how you do it, but I'm going to be with you when you do it. If only to do it. Embrace and rejoice. Hey, writing this sermon has been one of the hardest sermons for me to write, actually. It started out as a casual curiosity about what God meant when He 
said David was a man of blood. What does that even mean? You know, and, and he's, I've actually got spoiled lately because I've known, okay, what's the thing to preach next? The next commandment, right? And when, when Jared was like, just preach whatever, like whatever, what do you do? You know, and then, okay, this is curious. I'm learning about the life of David. Hey, what does that even mean? And it turned out to be a sermon about what God means when he says no. It's tricky like that. It's brought out some of the deepest pains for me, but having dwelt on the richness of truth and God's word about the subject, I, I, I'm never more certain about this thing that I'm telling you, that we have to embrace in our joys. I'm convinced. I feel like going forward, and I pray God preserves this feeling in me that I can stand before any no God has to throw at me because I trust in him more fully, believing this. I trust in his love for me. I trust that he has made me the way he wants to make me. And he's made me good in the here and now, and that he'll make me even better in the future. I trust that he knows what he's doing, and that no bend in the plan is any indication that he loves me less. He's my father, and I'm his son. But I can only say that because I know whom I believe, and I'm persuaded that he's able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. Can you say that, that you're a child of God? It's not who you're born to, or how much time you spent in a church, or even spent time reading the Bible or doing good deeds, like Jared said last week. It's only through Christ. It depends solely on what Christ has done for you. And if that's where your faith, hope, and trust are placed, that's, what, that's where it matters. It depends on the one who walked these words, who embraced and rejoiced, the one who was promised to David and filled him with joy to behold. He alone can save. He alone can walk the valley of the no and take you home when it's done. And in Christ himself, all the promises of God find their yes in him. That's why it's through him that we can utter our amen to God for his glory. So let us utter the amen when we ask in faith and receive his answer by embracing and rejoicing whatever that answer may be. Let's pray. Father, as often as the case, the hardest truths to accept become the greatest comforts of our lives. So through your Holy Spirit, let us accept these truths that we might throw ourselves more fully on the rock of ages. Father, to realize that you are our hiding place and our shelter, you are our future. You will take us home. So you love us and like us. You're making us to be the people you want to be. We are your children. We thank you for these things. In Christ's name, amen. amen.